All right, good morning. All right, good. You guys are nice and alive this morning. It's good. Uh, the past few weeks we've been on this series on marriage and what the Bible has to say about it. And we've been looking at different things such as intimacy within marriage, becoming best friends. We've been looking at things like what does the Bible say about who men and women and, and roles and things like that out of Genesis. And we've been talking about what is God's design, God's principles for it all. And today we're kind of beginning to pivot into things that stress us out in marriage and that put stress on marriages. So the very first thing we're going to talk about today is sex. And so uh, it's like, I, I just, <laughs> yes, do I have your attention? Yeah. Okay. Some of you are very excited for this, <laughs> this teaching. And you're going to be even more excited when you find out that as I was writing this, year, this message, I was like 30 minutes deep. Now I have like a counter that tells me how long is this sermon going to be. And I have so much more to cover that I went, oh no, this is two weeks. This isn't one week. I thought, you know, when you're writing uh, outlines for series, I'm like, oh yeah, I could cover that in one week, and I could you know, throw some scriptures on this outline. Yeah, this is what it's going to look like. And then you get to writing, and you realize, wow, the Bible actually says so much more on this than I thought. And so uh, I gave that little warning to you guys via video that like, hey, if you have kids that would like to come with you, and you don't want to have to explain stuff to them too young, maybe put them in our kids' ministry. Uh, that's going to be for two weeks in a row. And if anything, today is the lighter and easier message. Uh, so anyhow, let's just dive right in. As a pastor, I've done premarital counseling for years and years and years. I've done not only premarital counseling, but I've done marital counseling, just whatever type of counseling. And, and here's my strategy as a pastoral counselor, just in case you ever come to me. You should know this up front. I try and help point you to Jesus and point you to what the Bible says. And oftentimes, people, like, that helps. However, I point out that all the books on my shelves are books of theology, not books of psychology. So if there's something much deeper, then I'm like after session one, and I'm like, whoa, we're, we're out of my territory. I'm probably going to hurt you more than I could help you. Then I refer off to like an actual certified counselor. I'm like biblical counselor, like point people to Jesus, and what does the scripture say, and how do we align that with our lives? Like that's what I do there. So one time, I, I'm telling you this because I had this married couple come to me one time that did not need to go to a deeper psychological counselor, like somebody with, you know, real psychology degrees on their wall and stuff. Because I always tell people right up front, like, listen, I have a theology degree here, not a psychology degree. So if you're here for something deeper, I, I'll give you the Bible. I don't know how much we're going to dive into your psychology here. But I've got, uh, when it comes to marriage counseling, and I have a married couple that comes down and sits in front of me and says, Pastor Dave, somewhere along the line, we lost it. We don't know what it is. There's nothing sinful happening in our lives. There's nothing, we've just lost the intimacy that we used to have. I, I usually pull out this three-part test, which I've talked about here before. Time, talk, touch. And we, and we look at that scripturally too, about spending time together and growing in intimacy and, and talking to each other, and communicating with each other, and then touch, especially in marriage, is, is a missing, it's such an important piece. And, and basically what they had said to me is, Pastor Dave, somewhere along the line, we became business partners rather than lovers. And so we talked about it. We were like, well, when did this first happen? What have you noticed? And, and, and so as we started talking about it, it all culminated with a work shift schedule issue. What happened was somebody got a new job in the marriage, and they were both working. And one person worked days, the other person worked nights, and they were kind of like ships passing in the night. They only talked about things. Like their conversations had completely turned into when do the kids need to get here? How much money do we need for this? What do we need for groceries? Blah, 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 blah. Their talks had turned into business partner talks, not talks that lovers have. Their talks had all turned into this. Maybe even as I'm describing this couple, some of you here today are like, oh, yeah, that's us too. And the thing is, is that business partners don't have sex. At least they shouldn't. Lovers do. Business partners don't. And what happens is 
yeah, you know, they had different schedules. They were like ships passing the night. They were constantly tired. They only connected over certain things. And we're sitting in the office uncovering that, and it's the first time they're talking about their wants and desires to each other in forever, maybe like a year. And, and so I, I just started asking the questions. I was like, let me ask you this. Are you guys still committed to this marriage? Yes, we love each other. We've loved each other ever since we were young. We're just in a rough spot right now. Okay. You still want this to work out? Yes. And I was like, is there anything you need to confess to each other? Do you guys have some sin? Have you, is there anything that like, somebody doesn't know about the other? And, and, and sometimes I take them separately to ask this question. It was no. We're, they, everything's wide open between us. We're Christian people. We love Jesus. But we are just, it couldn't be further away from each other at the moment. And so I was like, well, when, you, when was the last time you guys had a real conversation about how you're feeling and, and what's going on inside your hearts? Because I feel like that's grown cold. And they were like, I, I don't know. I don't know. They, they couldn't give me an answer. And I was like, okay, so when was the last time you had sex? And they kind of, their faces went red, my face went red, the, all that. Where, you know, it was, it was an awkward time. And they were like, it's been a while. And so I said, okay, well, you guys don't have a lot of time, right? We're about maybe like 15 minutes into the session here, about like an hour-long time to meet. You guys don't have a lot of time, right? Because you got to get to work and you got to blah, blah, blah. You got to get to sleep, all that stuff. They're like, yeah, we don't have a lot of time. I was like, great, we're going to end this right here. <laughs> I've got homework for you. And the homework, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of you are like, Pastor Dave, when can we get you uh, scheduled in for some marriage counseling? No. <laughs> the homework is you need to go have a real conversation about what you're feeling and what hurts you guys might have and where you're sad and all that stuff. And then at a certain time, you just end it and have sex. You're a married couple. You were designed for this. Just go do that. Because if there, there was no major hurts, there was no major hangups. Now, if somebody had been profoundly betrayed, would I have told them that? No. You know, I, there, there would have been a different counseling thing to send them to. Th but that wasn't the case. They were otherwise happy, healthy, but their schedules had turned them into business partners and not lovers. So I sent them off and said, you guys need to rekindle this part of your relationship. God designed you for this. Go have fun. And you know what happened? They did. And you know what? <laughs> they came back to Sunday like, Next Sunday, like smiling, I'm like, "How's it going?" And only them and I knew how was, you know, what we were talking about. How's it going? They're like, "Great, Pastor." I'm like, "Okay, great. Keep it up." And it's just that every now and then you turn into these areas of your life and into your relationship where you become business partners and not lovers. But God designed sex; He made it. He, de he, he developed our bodies for it, and then he created a safe spot for it, and that safe spot for it is called marriage, and that's what I want to talk about today. So your first fill in your notes say, we're just going to start with this, is God designed sex as a blessing in my marriage. God designed sex as a blessing in my marriage. Notice how I made you write it down. I'm like trying to desensitize you to this word, because I'm going to be saying it so much over the next two weeks. So before... We dive into this. I want to just acknowledge three historical lies about sex that affect our views today. And some of you might have some of this view of sex. There's three historical lies that have been talked about even in the church. And they affect our views today on this. So one, uh, the first lie, sex is just an appetite. That's it. And in fact, I even said it. God designed your bodies with the ability to have sex. God designed you this way. So here the idea is like a deeply Greek and Hellenistic idea that we find actually Paul addresses in the book of 1 Corinthians. But it says, so the idea here is just neutral. It's like, hey, just like being hungry, just like a nap natural appetite, when, when you're hunger, when you have hunger, you... Huh. Let me scoot that back. When you have hunger, you go eat. So, you know, sex is just a natural feeling. So when you have that, then just go, enjoy. That's the first lie. Paul talks about this to the church in Corinth because 
Paul's responding to them. He says, you say the stomach for food and the food for stomach, but I say honor God with your bodies. So what he's saying is we have these natural desires that are hardwired into humanity by the Lord, but every desire needs to be brought under the discipline of the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians, that everything needs to be disciplined by the Lord, even our speech and everything that we say. All of our desires are need to be disciplined by God. If you never stop eating, if you don't discipline that desire, and you're just eating all the time, well, you're going to gain weight. If you discipline that desire and only eat when you're hungry and only eat the right things, all that stuff, then you'll do fine. It's just the, the way of disciplining these desires. We do this in other areas of life, but for some reason, the lie in our society is you don't need any discipline when it comes to sex. That's the lie. So the first lie is that sex is just an appetite, it's just a neutral thing, it's just a neutral medium of exchange, but the Bible says you actually bond together with somebody for life. That's what scriptures say. Lie number two, sex is dirty. And you've probably heard this if you grew up in church in some fashion or another, because this is the lie that the church likes to tell, that sex is dirty, sex is bad, and, and so just, you know, don't ever do it. It's, it's terrible. In fact, the, the earliest church theologians, um, Origen and some other guys, would, would tell you, like, if you were doing marriage counseling with Augustine or Origen or some of the early guys, they would say, yeah, sex is only for procreation. So in your marriage, you should withhold each other from each other as much as you can. But Paul never talked about this. Paul actually had an incredibly freeing view of this in 1 Corinthians 7. He was like, listen, your bodies belong to each other. If you're married, do not withhold yourselves from one another. So, but early Christians in, in this, this is what the church is guilty of. That sex is dirty, sex is not good, and, and all this stuff. And, and there's even this view that we have that the first place we see sex is outside of the garden. It's actually a mistaken view. So I, maybe you believe that. But what I want to tell you right now is that I believe that for Adam and Eve, sex was a pre-fall recreational activity. Anybody disagree with me on that? Anyways, that's what I believe, and let me tell you why. Genesis 1.28 God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. How do you, are you able to be fruitful and increase in number without a sexual relationship? Right? God told Adam and Eve at their creation, be fruitful, increase in number, have kids. There's only one way to do that. Right? Right? God told pre-sin Adam and Eve to go increase in number. He's telling them, go have sex. Another verse, Genesis 22, 24 through 25 says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Think about this for a second. If you're married here, there's this uh, time where you are literally connected, where you are literally one flesh. What is that time? You're like, Pastor, why are you talking about this? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the first time in the Bible that it talks about Adam and Eve being husband and wife, it also includes the sexual relationship. So don't buy into the lie that Bible talks about this in gross terms. It doesn't. The Bible talks about sex in beautiful terms. There's an entire book called The Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, depending on your, your preference there, that literally just... Uh, puts marital sex on a pedestal and talks about it in glorious terms. It, it's like 12 chapters of the Bible. Kids, it, Jewish kids are not allowed to read that until it's, they're over 18 because of how graphic that book gets. So we sometimes bring our own prudishness or our own fears or sometimes somebody has absolutely ruined us in this area. 
whether it's abuse, whether it's seeing something you shouldn't have seen early on, whether it's pornography, whether it's something like that, and, and you feel shame and there's some sin in this area, then oftentimes the, it, we will fall into this trap and this lie that sex is gross and that we shouldn't have anything to do with it. So don't buy into the lie that the Bible talks about this. There's areas in our lives that might need to be redeemed by Jesus, but it's just not scripturally true. There's some very erotic things in the Bible. Uh, next week, I'll go into a lot more of them, uh, but uh, here's just one example. And by the way, the book of Song of Songs is written from the wife's perspective. It, it's t- the dominant voice is the female voice there talking about her husband, Solomon. And I, I think the, NA, the NRSV is probably the, the, the least bashful uh, translators when it comes to this one verse, so I gave it to you in the NR, NSV up, up in the screen. Uh, a loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. I'm sorry, this is Proverbs, not, this is Proverbs. I'm, I'm further ahead in Song of Solomon in my notes. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon writes this about the wife. A loving doe, a graceful de- deal, deer, May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. So in the Bible, it says, in other words, it's a proverb saying that husbands should let their wives' breasts fill them with delight. Did you think you were going to hear that coming to church this morning? No. It's saying married people be intoxicated by each other's passion and love for one another. That's what it's saying. And it's a good thing. And then Song of Solomon, sorry, this is the NRSV. This is uh, the, the commentators, uh, not commentators, the translators around this book are wildly different. So if you were to read different translations, you would find out that they're wildly different, probably based on different cultural backgrounds that they bring to the translation, because some of them are really, really bashful when it comes to this book. But the NRSV people probably get the closest to the actual Hebrew. Um, it's a woman describing her husband. And there's another chapter where the husband describes the wife, and it starts at the head and goes all the way down to the toes, and they're naked. Like, both descriptions. Uh, so chapter 5, verse 14. His hands are like rods of gold set with barrel. His abdomen carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. So most Hebrew translations talk about she's describing her husband's private areas. And that's in the Bible. Like, I'm not making this stuff up. It's there. My point is, why am I talking about this? <laughs> the Bible's not bashful about it. It's not. It's us that are bashful about it. Now, again, there is areas where people have been absolutely wounded by sex, abused, The statistics are that one in five women reported, that's reported, are sexually assaulted or abused sometime in their lives. That's 20% of the reported case. The actual numbers are probably much higher. And so when people bring shame and hurt into relationships, it's so easy to fall into this view that the Bible sees sex as a gross thing. But what I would say is those are sins that have been committed against you and those are things that need, you and Jesus need to do some work on because Jesus wants to redeem you and restore you in that area. And I believe he absolutely can. This is the last slide uh, about sex. And again, there's a trillion of them, but this is the last general one. And this is a lie that is primary in our culture in the last about 100 years. And that sex is your primary identity. This is a lie that is, like I said, It's really just been in our society really probably closer to the last 100 years, maybe 150 years, but that sex is a primary form of self-expression, that you need to find your entire identity on sex and everything forms around that. It says that sex is primary for your fulfillment and your actualization and makes you a whole person. In the last 20 years, newer sociologists have changed, some of you might be shocked to learn this, but they've changed something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Some of you have seen this. It's like a triangle, and on the bottom triangle is like safety and security. 
And on the bottom, most basic part, and that's what you get as an infant, safety and security, new sociologists have come out and said, actually what that includes now is sex. And you're like, what? And they're like, yes, the sexual identity of the child needs to be explored early on, and they need to decide that for themselves as part of their own identity formation. And obviously, traditional psychologists and, and sociologists have really gone back against that, saying this is bonkers, it's far too early for a kid to develop this. But this is a lie, and church, we have to guard against this lie, and all your kids are hearing this, whether they're at school or homeschooled or whatever, what, they're just hearing it, this is the air they breathe in, that your primary identity somehow needs to include your sex or your sexual preferences. As a kid, I was watching TV, and, and we didn't have the, the same kind of like sexual conversations that we're having now as a culture. The sexual conversations that we're having now as a culture are LGBTQ, transgender, and, and all that. But as a kid, when I was watching TV, it was all about, you need to have sex before you go to college. It like makes you a, a more fulfilled person. And you need to just jump into bed with people. Like, these are the conversations that I saw as a kid. So what I'm saying is that sexual identity piece, it's just shifted from the focus. But it's been around for years. Probably started with the sexual revolution in pre-World War II Germany. And then moving on from there. And it has just permeated every single conversation. And it's wild to go into business or government meetings or something and then people having to introduce themselves with their primary sexual identity. That's how you could tell that this is an identity thing. This is a lie that's permeated into our culture, like all the way, and saying, that's my primary identity. This is an empty well. It's an empty well, church. Every person is fearfully and wonderfully made, and what defines them is not their gender, their sexual preferences, or anything like that, but what defines them is that they are loved deeply by God, and he sent his son as a rescue mission to die for them and redeem them and make them new. What defines people where we should get our primary identity, church, is that we are children of the Lord. That is where our primary identity comes from. So there, there's three lies. That sex is just a neutral medium of exchange. That it's just an appetite. It's just a feeling, two, that sex is gross and bad. Or three, that it is your primary identity. And so we've got to watch out for these lies because they seep into every part of this conversation. You see why we needed two weeks on this? I'm almost out of time, and, and I've just covered the three lies and I'm only halfway through this sermon. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about, we've talked about the lies that, that, that are surrounding this conversation of sex, but let's talk about the truth of the matter. Sex is so powerful that the only thing that contain it is the covenant of marriage. Sex is so powerful. And I want to talk today about the power of what God has created in sex. And, and, and you even have to ask yourself, when you read the Bible, one of the things that you'll notice, like if you just read it start to finish, I, I had this um, privilege as a kid when I came to Christ at age 14 to just read the Bible without the church interpreting it for me. And I just started, I just became a Bible reader and I started reading the Bible and I would encourage anybody, just go read your Bibles. What, what I discovered is that there is sexual language all over the Bible from page one all the way to the end, there's sexual language all over it. And some of it has to do with how much God loves us. He calls us his bride. And, and you have to ask the question, why does God ordain such language? And I think it's because it's the only language that he has powerfully enough to explain how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. So sex is so powerful that God had to create a safe space for it. And that safe space is marriage. Marriage is a covenant between two people so profound that these two people virtually become one new person. I want to suggest that we need to look at uh, Jesus' interpretation of Genesis 
in order to really get this and understand this. Because what's happening here, and we're going to be in, in Matthew 19 for a second. What happens is that Jesus is approached by a religious teacher, a, a, a Pharisee. He's a religious teacher. He teaches the Bible. And he asks about a contemporary debate surrounding marriage. He asks about divorce. And so in Matthew 19, 3 through 6, we're going to pick up that conversation. And what Jesus does is he gives us commentary on Genesis 1 and 2. So let's look at that now. Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I love that in a debate on divorce, clearly, Jesus clearly defines God's intention with marriage and the power of what marriage is. By the way, just as an aside, I love that Jesus asks the very religious scholar, haven't you read? I think that if any of us were to ask Jesus a question today, he might say, haven't you read? And what are you going to say back to him? (laughs) Are you reading your Bible? (laughs) Like, oh no, Jesus, I meant to get to it. But yeah, haven't you read? It's such an important question. What does he say? He says, God made male and female, and these two are intended to marry. And a man is united to his wife. The word united here in in the Hebrew word, in the Hebrew mind, united means to cleave or to make a binding contract. So in Genesis chapter 2, when it says that they were, they were, a man was united to his wife, that word united means to cleave or to make a binding contract. It's the first marriage ceremony. And this is what Jesus is saying, that what we're looking at in Genesis, the the ideal of Genesis is the very first marriage ceremony that you're going to see. And then Jesus affirms the sexual relationship between husband and wife. The two become one flesh. And then Jesus' commentary on this verse is that you are no longer two, but now you are one. Jesus is affirming the order. Covenant first, then sex. And that makes you one flesh. This is what Jesus is doing. The marriage covenant is a public ceremony where you proclaim that you will practice fidelity to your spouse. By the way, Jesus talks about marriage as a metaphor for his relationship with Israel. And what is the number one issue that he always brings out in his relationship with Israel? Fidelity, faithfulness. You're worshiping other gods. You have been unfaithful. And then he likens it to a woman who is unfaithful with her husband. Fidelity is the number one issue when it comes to covenant. These are documents that you sign. Witnesses that you have to be there. The original idea is that the pastor is the stand-in for the Lord, uniting you two in marriage. In fact, I know we don't read this uh, because... We don't have Hebrew minds, but if you were a Hebrew person reading Genesis the way Jesus was, there would be no question that Jesus intends marriage to be a monogamous relationship between man and woman to last forever. That's the ideal, the Genesis ideal. The fact that Genesis and Jesus quotes the man will leave his father and mother denotes a new family is being formed. When you join in marriage, And that sexual relationship begins. Guess what you're beginning? A brand new family. It means the former covenant, child-parent covenant, it means it's superseded by the new covenant of marriage. And we're going to talk about this in in this series uh, about kids. It doesn't mean that as you grow up, you begin to dishonor your parents. The, The commandment is still there. Honor your father and mother so that you can live a long life. It's the only commandment that is attached to a promise that you're going to die if you don't. (laughs) So you better honor your mom and dad. But my point is that marriage supersedes, that new covenant supersedes that old covenant of parental relationship. Now the relationship is always there and it's still there. But the idea is that marriage requires new priorities for a new family. The sexual boundaries have always been drawn within the protection of marriage within the protection 
of covenant. That's the idea. This is how marriages flourish. When you have the protection of a promised fidelity to each other. Then sex within marriage becomes the most intimate and the most tangible way of growing the unity that you've already promised to each other. So unmarried people, here's what I can tell you about sex. God has designed marriage to include sex, and in the protection of marriage, you can experience a better intimacy and better sex than you ever thought was imaginable. Literally, if you follow God's design, and, and the first time you have sex on your, and is on your wedding night, then you're following God's design. And guess what? That first time might not be great. And it might not be great for a couple years later. But the idea is that you're growing together in that relationship where you have promised fidelity and it gets better and better and better. Now, why am I saying this? I'm not saying this just because I'm up here and I'm some kind of perv ball wanting to talk about sex. I'm saying this because the Bible says it, and I'm saying this also because modern studies have proven that that is true. That sexual happiness among couples is like a thousand times higher for people who have waited to have sex until after they're married. There are studies that prove this over and over and over again, and it shouldn't surprise us because this is the design of the Bible. This is the design of God. We have a sex-obsessed culture that tells you, have sex before you're ready. Have sex before there's the covenant. Have sex be just any time. Go on a date and have sex. Just do all, all these different things. And we're going to talk about what Paul has to say about this. But what we find is that that is an empty well that essentially depletes you uh, of your joy, that depletes you of connecting with people in a deep and intimate way. It depletes you of life rather than having life and having it to the full. God actually designed marriage that the longer you're married, the better you get at a sexual and intimate relationship because the more you know each other. Red face, moving on. Okay. So don't live outside God's design for marriage. So caution. Sex is designed by God for lifelong commitments. I feel like you got that in the last point, but I may make sure you get it again. Okay. So we have to be cautious that sex is a power that unites. It's a power that unites, that God designed. Paul warns us against this to the church, warns against this in the church to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 16. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Paul is making a point to the church that there's a uniting power in sex. But not only that, what is the prostitute he's talking about in the book of Corinthians? Now, if you were to go to Corinth, one of the things that you would realize is part of temple worship to these pagan gods was, especially uh, fertility uh, cults, was that the man would worship by going and paying like a tithe and having sex with the temple prostitute. And then he'd become more fertile. That's what would happen, right? That makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense. But this is like an ancient system of cultic worship and things like that. And, and so what Paul is saying, listen, church, don't buy into the lie. You're a married man. Do not go and unite with that person because you're becoming one flesh with that person. Don't do that. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? And we're going to pick up on this theme first early on next week, by the way. We're going to pick up on this theme. But your bodies belong to Jesus. So why are you uniting that with something else? Men, why is pornography so prolific among men? What are you doing? Why is there such a prolific uh, idea to just go out and experiment? What God is saying here is, look, guys, your bodies have been bought with a price by Jesus on the cross. Honor God with your bodies. We're going to look at that scripture in a second. 
But sex is ultimately a uniting act, and it makes you one flesh with somebody else. And I think the biblical authors knew this, and, and, and they talk about this all the time. And there's actual physical evidence at play. One of the things that I love is when science catches up with the Bible. I, you know, this is something the Bible's been saying for years and years and years, but all of a sudden somebody did some study and stuck a person in an MRI machine and was like, oh, there's actual brain science to figure this out. And that's exactly what's happened in this area. There's, a, there's actually a really interesting uh, TED Talk by a woman named Helen Fisher, and she did uh, basically a study on sex where she took people in all the different stages in the relationship and stuck them in MRI machines and asked them questions. And let me just, I want to outline some of her research findings. Um, and just so you know, I've, if you were interested in this, go watch the TED Talk, but I severely cut this down a lot. Um, and it's really oversimplified in my version, okay? So the first stage of relationship is infatuation. And it has a surprisingly powerful impact on the brain. It finds that falling for someone impacts the brain centers, the same brain centers as a, a drug addict who takes cocaine. Did you know that? Isn't that crazy? Okay, it's with a similar intensity even as cocaine. This area is the motor of the mind associated with the basic drive of such as wanting, motivation, hunger, craving, and focus. It works beneath the regions to deal with cognitive thinking and emotion. Romantic love, it turns out, is a powerful drug that, ba- that connects us with our basic life cycle, our basic drives. But this first stage in relationships has a very short, very short window. It's a very short natural life cycle. And she says it like this. Like the booster on the space shuttle, it burns bright for a time, then falls away. This explains why we feel so alive in early romantic stages and why people make such significant um, careers, reputations, and exciting relationships in obedience to these feelings. Now, that's Helen's uh, research. Now, let me give you some biblical commentary on this. Stage one is where you build these compatibilities, where you become best friends, like we talked about in sermon number two of this series. It's, it's where you two talk and talk and talk. You spend time, and you talk together, you grow together, you find out if you're compatible, and you decide if you want to get married or not. It's where you become best friends leading towards marriage. But the dangerous part is to start having sex in this area of that infatuation stage. Why? Because the infatuation, although it seems like it overtakes everything in your brain, it burns so brightly in your brain, it's hitting on all those dopamine sensors and all that stuff, it fades so fast. And all of a sudden you're bonded with somebody you don't really even like. So it's important that you save that for marriage. The second stage, Fisher describes as the bonding experience of sexual intimacy. Beside the spiritual and emotional attachment that develops during these encounters, a strong physiological attachment also occurs. She says that there's no such thing, this is interesting to me as a secular, she's a secular scientist saying, there's no such thing as casual sex. Sexual climax releases a rush of certain neurotransmitters and hormones to these neurotransmitters. Dopamine intensifies the sensation of romantic love, while the hormones oxytocin, oxytocin and veropressin, I don't know, I'm not a brain scientist, deepen our emotional attachment to the other person. Oxytocin is also released when a mother breastfeeds her own baby, which bonds the mother and baby for life. Isn't that interesting? The same chemicals that are released in breastfeeding for women are also released in men and women when they have sex. It's the, what God said would happen, that the two would become one flesh. These are bonding hormones that are released in the brain. So when Genesis says that the two will become one flesh, they were naked and, and unashamed, uh, it, what, it, what it's doing is, what Genesis is doing is, is saying that their brain chemistry is altered. This is what this woman, this scientist had found out. Your brain chemistry literally is altered by the person you have sex with. It's a physical change in you. Then the final phase of relationship, attachment, is a deep sense of peace, warmth, and security that we could feel with a long-term partner. 
This is the consolidation phase of relationship, wherein the bond is deepened through the emotional and warm experiences, such as sharing a walk along the beach or watching a movie together. Neuroscience obviously can take us only so far, but it does shine a light on the power of these brain systems in consolidating a relationship, as well as on an essential problem with our cultural of authenticity. So th she's got a whole bigger talk on this, but here's the point. Some of you have been married for years, and you have a great relationship in the area of sex, and your biggest joy together sometimes is going away on vacation and just walking and being together for some time. That's awesome. This is it, it literally follows, what, what I think is so incredible is that what she found follows the biblical pattern. Cultural anthropology is just catching up with the Bible. Brain science is just catching up with the scripture. Paul ends his conversation about not treating sex flippantly and having casual sex with prostitutes, even though everybody was doing it, by saying this. You were bought at a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What is happening with the sex and prostitutes earlier before this is that that's a worship experience. And what Paul is saying is what you do with your body, whether you like it or not, is a worship experience. So what are you doing with your bodies? Who are you worshiping? Yourselves or the Lord? This is where we're going to pick up this conversation next week. So what I want to say to you is, this is part one. Please come back for part two because it gets so much deeper. Anyways, we've barely scratched the surface on this topic. But here's what I wanted to do today. We are finding as a staff that there's just so many different things throughout this series that have just bubbled up to the surface as it should happen, as it should be. So here's what we want to encourage you to do. We've got some different people that are going to be scattered around the back of the room that just want to pray for you. I want to invite the band to come forward. So whether it's something that I brought up today about the sex and the sexual relationship that you want to pray about, or whether it's something that we brought up early on about God's de designs and making priorities and all this stuff or surrounding marriage, intimacy, whatever it might be, and you just want prayer for that today, we want to encourage you that sometime during these next three songs that you go back and you receive prayer for this because we've got people who want to pray for you in this area and we want to pray for you in this area. And like every piece of <laughs> this series, the main message I want to get across is to have a healthy marriage or healthy relationship with people, a healthy single life, what's necessary is a relationship with Jesus. It's amazing what happens when redeemed people get together with redeemed people. People that used to be defined by their sin and their junk and their stuff and are now defined by the love of God. Maybe you're here today and you, you simply need that. You need redemption. Whether it's this area somebody's burned you sexually, you've been abused. Whether it's this area where you've seen things you shouldn't have seen. Whether this, it's this area of you have an unhealthy view or unhealthy stuff. God wants to redeem you of anything that might be in your past. Whether somebody hurts you or whether you have sinned. God wants to redeem you and make you new in this area. If you're hearing this message and feeling shame, that's the wrong thing that I'm trying to convey. The right thing is that God wants to redeem you and make you new and impact your marriages forever because you've surrendered to him. So I just want to end with a word of prayer right now. I want to invite you to worship, but I also want to invite you to, if you need prayer in this area, to go receive it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for all the marriages in this room. God, I pray that you would redeem and restore that which is broken. God, I pray that you would help us to have a healthy and truthful view of this area in our lives because it is the one thing that can so impact our marriages forever. And God, we know the truth of the matter that our marriages put the gospel on display. The way that we serve each other puts the gospel on display. The way that I love my wife puts the gospel on display. The way my wife loves me puts the gospel on display. So God, I pray that you would redeem and restore marriages in this room this morning so that other people might come to know you. God, we know that this is a
profound mystery, but you're talking about Christ in the church and how much you love us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your restoration. 